For days, Morrow wandered through the vast expanse of the Sahara Desert, lost and without food and water. The scorching sun relentlessly sapped his strength, pushing him to the brink of exhaustion. Severely dehydrated, he could no longer even resort to drinking his own urine. Morrow began to imagine where his lifeless body might eventually be discovered. A search helicopter had flown past, but the intense heat and endless dunes had concealed him from view. Days turned into an agonizing blur without water, food, or shelter, leaving him teetering on the edge of despair. In a desperate bid to survive, he resorted to drinking bat blood and consuming raw snakes and lizards. Hope abandoned him, and Mauro decided to take drastic measures and end his suffering. Yet the unforgiving desert was not ready to release its grip on him just yet. Mauro Prosperi lived a life defined by service and athleticism. A dedicated police officer by profession, he carried the discipline and determination of his roles into his true passion. Running. For as long as he could remember, running had been his solace, often engaging in it for 12 hours a day. For Mauro, running in extreme marathons is about more than just competition. It's about immersing oneself in the raw beauty of nature, traversing through breathtaking landscapes like majestic mountains, scorching deserts and icy glaciers. As a professional athlete, Mauro had never been able to truly appreciate these environments, always fixated on the singular goal of winning medals. The allure of experiencing nature in its rawest form was what drew him to such grueling events. It was pure fate that led Mauro to discover the Marathon des Sables. He had already retired from the pentathlon when a dear friend, Giovanni Manca, mentioned an incredible marathon taking place in the desert, only warning him that it would be extremely difficult. But Mauro lived for challenges, and the prospect of the Marathon des Sables captivated him. Without much hesitation, he accepted Giovanni's suggestion to enter the race. At 39 years of age, Mauro was ready to test the limits of his endurance. The ultra-marathon, held in Morocco, required participants to cover 400 miles across the scorching Sahara Desert, enduring daytime temperatures of 130 degrees Fahrenheit that plunged to 40 degrees at night. It was known as the toughest race of its kind, and Mauro was in the best shape of his life. He immediately began training, pushing his limits by running 65 miles a day and avoiding drinking water as much as possible to prepare his body for the harsh desert conditions. His desire to achieve the greatest success in his sports career led him to neglect his family. His wife Cinzia and their three children worried that his obsession would drive him mad. Cinzia couldn't comprehend the level of danger her husband was willing to face as he entered the Marathon des Sables, a race with such peril that participants were required to sign a form to indicate where they wanted their bodies sent in the event of death. Mauro tried to ease her fears, assuring her that the worst that could happen was a little sunburn. Despite persistent protests from his loved ones, Mauro traveled to Morocco and was at the starting line on April 10th as one of 80 ultramarathon participants. The landscape that surrounded him immediately captivated him, further convincing him that he had made the right decision. Giovanni Manca, who had persuaded him to take on this great challenge, was by his side. On the race day, he donned his distinctive red shirt, black cycling shorts, and a cap, complemented by new sneakers purchased specifically for the event. His backpack, weighing 55 pounds, was packed with precision, containing 2,000 calories per day, vitamin tablets, spare clothes, sunscreen, sleeping bag, compass, map, and other essentials crucial for survival in unexpected circumstances. Confident in his preparation, he believed the chances of disaster were minimal, reassured by the presence of experienced guides, ambulances, and regular water checkpoints. The race began with 80 runners setting off energetically, soon forming a dispersed line as many fell behind. Each competitor was provided with 10 liters of water daily, a necessity in the dehydrating environment of the Sahara. The Marathon de Sable of today 
with up to 1,300 participants, has become a snake-like affair, where getting lost is almost impossible. But in 1994, with only 80 participants, and many of them not even running, he found himself alone running for most of the time. The desert, with its silent allure and relentless heat, slowly drained their fluids, exacting its toll on their bodies. For Mauro, the desert became a vast golden sea, where he relished the solitude and a profound connection to the earth beneath his feet. As the fourth day approached, the longest and most challenging leg of the race loomed. Mauro, running alone, had outpaced many competitors, though some were still ahead. The warm wind hindered his progress, but did not dampen his spirit. He ran steadily, his legs untroubled by the scorching sand. As the day began, a strong wind was already blowing. Mauro had passed through four checkpoints when he entered an area of sand dunes, finding himself alone as the pacemakers had gone ahead. Then, massive sand dunes appeared, and he began the arduous ascent, muscles contracting and relaxing rhythmically. Suddenly, without warning, a vicious sandstorm erupted. The wind's roar intensified, and a dense black cloud surged towards him with alarming speed, engulfing him in a blinding storm of sand. The wind raged with a terrifying fury, enveloping him in a yellow wall of sand, blinding him and making it impossible to breathe. Caught in the sandstorm, Mauro was overwhelmed, struggling to comprehend the sudden, disorienting chaos. The relentless sand stung his skin and filled his mouth and nose, making each breath a desperate gasp. He fought to stay upright, but the storm's force was overpowering, reducing visibility to mere inches and isolating him in a terrifying, sandy void. Mauro's inner voice became his lifeline as he confronted the merciless Sahara. You have to keep moving. The sand will bury you, it urged, embodying an instinct for survival. The sand whipped his face, feeling like a storm of needles. For the first time, he understood the true power of a sandstorm. Visibility was non-existent, and the wind threatened to overpower him. The pain was relentless, as if millions of needles pierced his body, and the wind's ferocity, 100 miles per hour, was far more terrifying in reality than in any preparation. To protect himself, he turned his back on the wind and wrapped a scarf around his face to stop the sand from wounding him. He eventually crouched down in a sheltered spot, waiting for the storm to pass. After eight grueling hours, the wind finally abated, leaving a dimming sky in its wake. He decided to sleep on dunes that night. As he zipped up his sleeping bag, his thoughts turned to the next morning and the remaining 36 hours to complete that stage of the race or he would be disqualified. He was disappointed as he had been in fourth place, but decided to get up early the next morning to try and reach the finish. What he couldn't have imagined was how dramatically the storm would change everything for him. The next morning brought a breathtaking sunrise, rejuvenating him. Energized, he checked his map and compass, attempting to navigate the featureless expanse. However, without reference points, these tools prove futile. For nearly four hours he ran, ascending and descending the endless sand dunes, lost in the vast, uncharted desert. Recognizing the need to conserve energy, he decided to walk instead of run. Yet another internal voice questioned the purpose of walking without a clear destination, amplifying his uncertainty. As the Marathon de Sables requires self-sufficiency, Mauro was well prepared with a knife, a compass, a sleeping bag, and plenty of dehydrated food in his backpack. However, the problem he faced was the lack of water as he had only half a bottle left after the storm hit, which he drank as slowly as possible to make it last. His thirst became unbearable as the sun seemed to extract every drop of moisture from his body. When his bladder filled, he recalled his grandfather's wartime wisdom. Urine, when fresh, could be a source of hydration. Realizing the severity of his situation, Mauro took the drastic measure of urinating in his spare water bottle. His grandfather's World War II survival stories, once a source of boredom, now took on critical importance. 
To mitigate the relentless heat, he walked only in the cooler hours of the morning and evening, seeking shelter and shade during the peak heat. Wearing two hats and blessed with a dark complexion that spared him severe sunburn, he tried to stay optimistic. He believed that the race organizers, experienced in desert rescues, were searching for him. He reassured himself that he was not the first runner to be caught in a sandstorm and that others might also be lost. The next day, the distant sound of a helicopter sparked a fleeting hope. Mauro fired a flare and shouted, but the helicopter passed by without noticing him. The flares used at that time were much smaller and less visible compared to the ones used in later years. This left him with a deeper sense of isolation as the stark reality of his predicament became clear. Darker thoughts emerged, suggesting he was on the brink of death. Determined to survive, Mauro focused on moving forward, believing he had to reach somewhere eventually. Despite his escalating despair, he convinced himself that the race organizers had the resources to find anyone lost in the desert. On the third day of his desert ordeal, Mauro stumbled upon a marabout, a Muslim shrine where Bedouins often sought respite. With a flicker of hope, he approached, but the place was deserted except for a holy man in a coffin. Although it was filled with sand from multiple sandstorms, the marabout provided a roof over his head, and he felt a brief sense of relief. He evaluated his situation. It was not ideal, but he was physically well. He ate some of his rations, which he cooked with fresh urine, saving the urine he bottled for drinking, which he started to drink on the fourth day. Driven by instinct and a primal will to survive, Mauro explored the marabou and climbed to the roof to plant his Italian flag, hoping anyone searching for him could see it. While on the roof, he spotted some bats huddled together in the tower. He captured a handful of bats, cut off their heads, and mashed their insides with a knife, then sucked out the blood and ate at least 20 of them raw. This brutal act awakened a deep, ancestral survival instinct within him, a stark contrast to his civilized self. His inner voice justified the act as necessary, reminding him of the natural order of survival. Yet. Another voice within him, darker and more cynical, questioned the purpose of prolonging his agony. Eating bats, a repulsive necessity, highlighted his desperation. Despite the immediate relief, he felt an overwhelming sense of degradation. The sight of an airplane overhead sparked fleeting hope. Mauro frantically signaled for help, burning his remaining possessions and shouting into the void. Just as the plane flew by, Another sandstorm hit, lasting for 12 hours, and the airplane didn't spot him. For 12 hours, he endured the storm's fury, coming to understand why the Bedouins referred to this race as the Devil's Race. The inner struggle continued, with a voice persistently reminding him of the grim reality. Without sufficient water, he faced inevitable death. The voice detailed the gruesome effects of dehydration, foretelling a slow, agonizing demise as his body would begin to shut down, organ by organ. In his despair, Mauro contemplated surrender. The thought of dying alone in the desert, ensuring no one would find him and that his wife Chinzia would be left without his pension, weighed heavily on his mind. In Italy, when someone goes missing, they must be declared dead after 10 years. But if he was found dead in the Marabou, his wife would still have an income. He considered the Marabou as a potential final resting place, a place where someone might eventually discover his remains. As he grappled with his dire situation, the harsh inner voice of self-criticism struck a nerve. It accused him of using running as an escape from his family and responsibilities, of selfishly prioritizing his passion over his loved ones. Gazing at his reflection in a pocket knife, he saw a visage that resembled the very embodiment of despair his face blackened by sand, gaunt, with traces of blood on his lips. Contemplating the end of his life, Mauro was flooded with beautiful memories of his past, contrasting starkly with his present reality. Kneeling before the altar in the Marabou, he clasped his hands and prayed, thanking the saint for his life and seeking forgiveness for contemplating suicide. In a moment of desperation, 
he wrote a note to his wife with a piece of charcoal on a wall of marabou, and then slit his wrists with a knife, feeling no pain as he lay on the ground, awaiting death. However, death eluded him. When he awoke the next day, he realized his blood had clotted due to dehydration, preventing him from bleeding out. This unexpected survival felt like a sign, a message from that persistent inner voice that had been his ally from the beginning. It urged him to persevere, to see his continued life as an opportunity to fight on. Regaining confidence, he decided to see his situation as a new competition against himself, determined to survive despite the odds. A newfound strength surged within him, rekindling his determination and focus. He recognized the need for a plan. His training and preparation had endowed him with reserves of energy, and his backpack still contained vitamin tablets, a small but crucial resource. Remembering the guide's advice from before the race, he decided to head towards the clouds visible on the horizon at dawn, using his compass to navigate. For days, Mauro walked tirelessly, driven by this renewed sense of purpose. The desert continued to drain him, and he reached a point where he could no longer urinate due to severe dehydration. Yet, each step was fueled by a resolve that defied his physical exhaustion. Mauro, gripped by shivering and panic, searched desperately for signs of life, interpreting even dried dung as a clue. His inner voice encouraged him, suggesting that food was all around if he looked closely. He avoided the dangerous scorpions and other elusive desert creatures hiding in cracks and low bushes. As he wandered through the dry riverbeds, he sucked the juices from plants, hoping it wouldn't incapacitate him. At one point, he encountered a snake, its yellow body coiling and its triangular head flicking a tongue. The darker voice in his mind urged him to give up and let the snake bite him to end his suffering but his survival instinct prevailed. Recognizing the snake as potential food, he lunged at it, grabbing it with his hands and biting off its head. The snake's body continued to writhe as he fought for survival, determined not to become prey after his previous ordeal. He was acutely aware of his physical decline, noting how his watch became looser on his wrist as he lost weight. Despite his severe dehydration, he maintained his resolve, constantly on the lookout for any signs of life. He began to see the desert not just as an adversary, but as a place where life persisted, appreciating its harsh beauty and learning to read its subtle signs for survival. Meanwhile, the race organizers were conducting a search, with his brother and brother-in-law flying in from Italy to assist. They found traces of his presence, such as his shoelaces, and eventually reached the Maraboot, but they were convinced they were looking for a corpse. On the eighth day of wandering, Mauro finally came across an oasis. He saw human footprints and felt a surge of hope. Lying down by the green lake, he slowly sipped water for six or seven hours, mindful that drinking too quickly would make him vomit. His body, completely dehydrated, was in survival mode, unaccustomed to taking in food. The sight of the footprints reassured him that people couldn't be far, rekindling his hope for rescue and marking a turning point in his harrowing journey. The next day he saw goats in the distance and a little girl herding them. She saw him too and, terrified by his ghostly appearance, ran away. He followed her to a large Berber tent. As the men of the camp were away at market, the women were the ones to tend to him. Despite his rugged appearance, they treated him with kindness. An older woman came out of the tent, offering him a drink of goat's milk, though he was unable to stomach any food. He was not allowed into the tent because of traditional customs, but was placed on a carpet in the shade of the veranda. The women quickly sent someone to alert the police, as they often camped near military bases for protection. Soon after, the police arrived and blindfolded him, suspecting he might be a spy. They transported him to their jeep with guns drawn, and for a moment he feared they might kill him. However, once they learned he was a lost marathon runner, they celebrated and apologized for their cautious greeting. He had wandered into Algeria, 470 miles off course. 
At the hospital in Tindouf, Mauro's body, half dead and recovering from the brink of death, began its long journey to recovery. His survival seemed miraculous after nine days in the desert. Everyone, including the organizers, his brother and brother-in-law who had flown in from Italy, had been searching for his body, not expecting him to be alive. Mauro weighed only 100 pounds, 40 pounds less than when he started. His eyes hurt, his liver was damaged, but his kidneys were miraculously fine. For months, he could only consume soup and liquids, and it took him two years to fully recover from the ordeal. Mauro's near-death experience in the Sahara instilled in him a profound appreciation for life, the little things and the people around him. He learned that the line between life and death is perilously thin, a realization that only dawns when one teeters on its edge. Yet, he also discovered a deeper truth about himself. He couldn't live without the extreme challenges and the stark beauty of the desert. Four years later, he returned to the Sahara for another sand marathon. Through his ordeal, Mauro Prosperi found his true identity, a loner, a desert man. The Sahara, which had nearly claimed his life, had also become his sanctuary. Surviving there forged an unbreakable bond. The desert had become his home. Thank you so much for watching. We really appreciate your time and hope you enjoyed the video. If you liked what you saw, be sure to check out the other great content on our channel. Your support means the world to us, and we can't wait to bring you more. Thank you again, and see you in the next video.